Now, I think this is my last equation. <laughs> Yesterday, those of you who are here, well, far too many equations. This is quite an interesting equation, and it's not so very complicated. Life satisfaction is the dependent variable that we're trying to explain. It depends on a constant. It depends on income. Don't ask me why economists have always used M to measure income. <laughs> it depends on Q. This could be some non-marketed good that you consume. Uh, and particularly in our case, it could be something to do with your health. And it could also depend on various individual characteristics and then as an error term. So life satisfaction being explained basically by your income, the non-market good that we're interested in, which may be health or health related, and then your individual characteristics. Now, the interesting twist here is to recognize that you could, in principle, give people money, but a poorer health state. And you could, you could, they might trade off um, the two. This is what we had with our willingness to pay study. We were having, when we talked about willingness to pay earlier on, the question was, um, how much would you be willing to pay um, in order to get a particular health benefit? And so you'd be giving up money in order to get benefit. Well, same idea could happen here. So if we compare the two sides of this equation, there's life satisfaction given a particular income, given a particular level, Q1, of the non-marketed good, and given your personal characteristics. There's a life satisfaction here where same income, but um, some pay payment here. So you're going to reduce your income. A different level of the non-marketed good, of course, your same characteristics. And so the life satisfaction in two cases has been set equal. And in that case, if we rearrange everything, the willingness to pay is this coefficient, beta 2, times the difference in the non-marketed good divided by beta 1. Now, that's um, maybe sort of gobbledygook. It's just the way economists think. But the point is, um, if you can ask, if you can associate different levels of life satisfaction with the presence or absence of different diseases, and if you control for income, if you control for people's other characteristics, you can get this, um, this uh, trade-off. How does that relate to the East Roman paradox? You know, the East Roman paradox that the more people, the more income people have, it's the less it adds to their happiness. Yeah. And this looks like a linear addition. Yeah. But I, I'm more familiar with Eastland in a sort of, um, uh, relative, relative income hypothesis that how, how you feel is not so much how much you have, but how you compare to other people. And so if you have um, more than other people, you're better off. Um, well, this is as it were being done f for the individual. And so the individual's having to compare themselves um, This suggests that you yeah. have more income and you have more, you have standard individual characteristics. Yeah. That doesn't change per person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Standard error. Then the major factors are going to be my income and my non marketing good, which is presumably my health. Yes, it's health. It's, the, for example, presence of diabetes or absence sure. of diabetes. So if we increase my income, I should be more satisfied. And in principle, if my health has changed, you could cut, yes, yes, but you could compensate me as it were. If you give me money and diabetes, I can be left as well off as I was originally. And then the issue is, well, how much money would we have to give you to compensate you for the diabetes? Uh, obviously, yes, again, that's, the, that's the game we're playing, uh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So, if we look at the results that came out of this, essentially, how much extra money is required to compensate an average person for having a particular health problem, we get some interesting values here. Um, some of them quite, low, well, in a sense, low, seven, six, five, 
all figures are in thousand pounds per annum. So this is implying that given the people they sampled, the average person, um, for example, would be willing to, to um, would need 6,000 pounds a year to compensate them for difficulty in hearing as opposed to no difficulty. Or diabetes, indeed 6,000 again. Um, the average person, if you gave them 6,000 pounds and diabetes, would be as well off as no diabetes and not the 6,000. Depression, 455,000 pounds per year. I like that <laughs> Yeah, it's quite attractive. I think I would be willing to be depressed. Well, actually, if you were that depressed, you probably, the money wouldn't help. Eight million for a drug addiction? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you, you would need the money to feed the habit. Uh, yeah, personally, I think these numbers are all over the place. I think some of the sort of smaller numbers, yeah, might be all right, but I only introduce this as an example of how life satisfaction has been used. Uh, it's been used to derive a monetary valuation. These are all hypotheticals to healthy people asking them to imagine. Yeah. Uh, and to I, actually, I've only worked with terminal patients, but if you ask healthy people to imagine a terminal state and you compare that with what terminal patients yeah. really say, it's totally skewed. Yeah. So we really need to ask drug addicts and depressed people and people with uh, hard of hearing and compare this to healthy people we get a reasonable yeah. reading. Yeah. Well, that's what the Swedish study did with regard to EQ5D. Right. And I would argue that's the only reliable index of EQ5D because mm. all the others are imaginary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the usual answer that's given to that, or counterpoint given to that, is. Um, Many of us have not experienced that health state, but we do know perhaps what pain is. We do know um, what we understand what mobility is. We understand about self care. Uh, we may have had family members who have experienced these um, health states. And so it's hypothetical for us, but we can still understand it or imagine it. Um, whether we buy that or not, I don't know. Do you know what Susan Gould at the University of Michigan? Mm -hmm. She was asking African Americans in Detroit about health choices which they hadn't experienced. And her answers like these were all over the marketplace. So she invited people in winter to gymnasia of schools that were empty and gave them free uh, tea or coffee and popcorn. She, but they could be warm and they could play a game, like a, a monopoly game or a life game. And in this game, they would break limbs, they would have babies, they would get hospitalized for different things. Um, and they would see how much it would cost them if they were hospitalized or if they had a baby, mm. and how much they would lose from their collective savings and so on. After a month or two of playing these life games every couple of days uh, to get out of the cold in Detroit, people made much more realistic decisions because they've been primed to realize how expensive and painful various situations had been. If you just ask them to imagine, their imagination is all over the waterfront. Yeah. But if you prime them by giving them some education, mm. like your anime for mm. the uh, four-year-olds, mm. or Susan Gould's game of life mm. for diabetes and having a baby and whatever, then it gets much more accurate. Right. Yeah, I, I'm definitely, I mean, what's sometimes been used in getting health state valuations is to try and give more information about the health state. Uh, one example, before I move on, was with respect to restricted vision. And so they got people to wear special goggles, which restricted your vision, similar to a patient, for example, the cataract might experience. And uh, you can see the idea but of course, there is a difference between having the goggles on for an afternoon and that's how you live your life. But I, I take the point. Um, and it relates to the other point that um, 
Can people who haven't experienced something, can they give meaningful valuations? Uh, so it's definitely an issue there. 